very much. I think we have a quorum. I think we have a quorum. Well done. You are very strong. You are sustainable. You have stayed the course and now you are here in the Red Room, which, so I'm told, is the only show in town, which is why so many of you are here after 6 p.m. after such a long day in the plenary. So congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Fantastic. So you're all here because you are interested in a brighter future for forestry, investing in youth career development. Now you'll recall if you were in uh, Korea for the World Forestry Congress that we had a huge emphasis on the youth. There were hundreds of young people from universities and colleges, activists from all over the place who were there. We gave them a very prominent role and we are building on that in this session today. So welcome to this special event. I'm Henry Bonsu. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a British Ghanaian journalist and broadcaster and moderator for lots of UN organizations, including FAO. I feel very much part of the team now. They're going to keep me here in Rome, even though I have to escape and go back to London on Friday. But it's great to be here and to be understanding much more about what you're doing, especially when it comes to forestry. Uh, for those of you who need it, this event is available in the six UN languages and you can just tweak your little buttons to get the language that you're comfortable in. Uh, the event is going to be recorded and available after the session finishes. So what we're going to focus on now is what we can do to create a bright future for forestry by supporting the career development of youth and young professionals. You'll be aware that there is a potential 33 million jobs in this sector, in forestry. How many of those will go to youth? How many youth at this point see their future in forestry? 10%? 20%? Less? We have to convince them that there is potential in this sector. Fantastic. So I'm delighted that to get us started with energy, enthusiasm and focus, it's my honour to welcome FAO's Director General, Dr. Xu Dongyu, to give his opening remarks. Director General. I am surprised you are pronouncing my surname so correctly. That's also uh, close to my uh, uh, native speaker. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear young friends, today's special event is organized by and for youth. Only one of the key messages from this week's session of the COFA is that a healthy forestry means a healthy society, healthy economy, and healthy ecosystems. To achieve this, we must continue to plant seeds and seedlings for a better, more sustainable future. I just told my friends that my hometown covered the 68% of the forest rate. And so it's very green and it's a subtropical region all year round green. So uh, bright future for forestry, but we invest we need the investment. Not only money, we have to invest the future. What is the future? Future is the use. We cannot do that without the use. Together with all of you here today and some of you online of course. You are our next generation of leaders, business makers, and ordinary workers. And that the bridge to a health future with all of your contributions from a younger generation. The role of the forestry is changing for an increasing recognized as a crucial part of the solution in addressing today's complex global challenges. From the climate to hunger, from the poverty to so social economic inequalities, with this changing role is a growing demand for expertise in sustainable forest management, forest conservation and restoration, agroforestry, and the forest-based 
bio economies. We need to make the forest sector more appealing to young people. As uh, uh, DDG Samedo once mentioned, make this sector more sexy, more attractive. Yeah? And uh, we must make sure that the young people have uh, skills to shift the continuously involving forest sector by one, investing in education and career development. Second, highlighting the expertise and the contributions of young professionals. And the third, provide a purely opportunity for youth to strive and emerge as leaders, as business makers. Dear friend, we must work and engage with you today, young people. The Youth Call for Action work with us, launched at the 15th World Forestry Congress call on young professionals to work together towards a more inclusive and enabling forest sector. We must res respond to that call. I made a special reply and so led us to that call after we met in the uh, Seoul, Korea. I remember very well. Today's event will showcase examples and opportunities from a number of the initiatives, policy decisions, enterprises, and actions that can inspire us all. We must ele elevate and celebrate the passion, creativity, and the commitment of young people as key drivers of the positive change. Yeah, of course, nowadays we have to be careful with the positive. Yeah. But positive change is very good, most welcome. Today's youth are very much well engaged in and more sustainable and inclusive approaches. Upon taking office in 2019, I launched the first ever FL Youth Committee and FL Women's Committee to foster their engagement and innovative spark. Spark can make a bigger, uh, uh, brighter future. If you see the passion, and the nourish, and the care. So, and I'm very pleased to the fruitful results now after three years. There has been important networking among the young FO staff, active at global engagement through the World Food Forum Youth action track and a large involvement of FO first mentorship program. So last year, uh, by FO Youth Committee, we initiated the World Food Forum first. And next month, the next week, from now on, about the uh, two weeks, we will have a Global Investment Promotion Week and also a Global Science and Innovation Week at the same time. So I said it's uh, two wheels to transform agrophysics together. And that's really power and a contribution from FL Youth Committee and the UMES Committee with a short time, eh? only three years. This is why FL Strategy Framework 2022-31 embraces youth, gender, and inclusion as a cross-cutting theme for all our work. Investing in a sustainable future means investing in use. Guanzi in China is about 475 BC. So it's about 2,500 years ago in ancient China told us that it takes 10 years to grow a tree, but 100 years to natural talents. So we need a lot of uh, uh, investment on use and the younger generation because that's our future. That's our uh, endless, uh, you know, uh, planet, which we are uh, inherited from generation to another. So today, let us seize and create every opportunity to uplift the youth so they can be the leaders that the forest sector and the world needs for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, uh, and a better life for all living no one behind. I uh, thank you. We should have a successful event and make more engagement, more solidarity among youth and across the generations. So 
And that's real intergenerational solidarity. I thank you. Director General Dr. Xu, thank you very much. That was a great way to open the session. And because you gave us this saying from thousands of years ago, I was immediately on Google to try and find the roots of it. 10 years to grow a tree, but 100 years to nurture a person or to cultivate a people. Yeah. So I thank you for <laughs> expanding my to... young brain. <laughs> thank That's you thank so you. much. Okay. Wonderful way to get us deep into this session, highlighting all the work that FAO is doing with the promotion and also trying to make this sector more sexy, I think you said, and attractive. No, the SDG uh, Samedo said. But I thought you adopted, <laughs> I thought you adopted I the saying. Yeah, because she didn't come here because she was a telework, yeah? Oh, I see. You are channeling the deputy DG. Okay, no, I see. She is responsible for the forest. Okay. So I want to make her more visible here. Very good, <laughs> Dr. Chu. You have done her proud. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so we're going to build on your opening remarks, sir, by moving into a keynote presentation. The title of the presentation is this. Achieving the World Forestry Congress 15 Youth Call to Action. And the person who is going to explain how we can do this is Elaine Springer, who is the founder of 4YP. Elaine, you have the floor. Good evening, Director General Chu Dong Yu, Alexander Buck, distinguished delegates and colleagues, both young at heart and young professionals, and a special warm welcome to everyone joining online. As mentioned, I'm Elaine Springay. I am the founder and chairperson of the Global Network for Forestry Young Professionals, or 4YP. And I have the privilege and honor to represent young professionals in the forest sector sharing our collective challenges, the solutions we have for ourselves, as well as for the sector to improve youth engagement and empowerment. So how do young people see the sector? Unfortunately, the forest sector is not particularly appealing to young people at the moment. Young people are interested in green jobs, su suggesting that forestry is not sufficiently marketing itself as a green career option. Low recruitment means the workforce is aging and does not necessarily relate to younger generations. Many of us young professionals in the sector, including myself, stumbled into forestry accidentally and may or may not have an educational background in forest management. This often means young people feel unprepared for our careers. Jobs often emphasize having hard technical skills, but education increasingly focuses on theory and soft transferable skills. They're often limited on the job training opportunities. To gain the necessary skills, most young people experience job insecurity. We build our early careers through volunteering and short-term contracts finally gaining job security well into our 30s. We're also part of a silent or hidden workforce, often contributing our expertise behind the scenes and are not visible. In 2021, 4YOP ran a survey. We received responses from around 700 young professionals from 79 countries. They expressed challenges related to career development workplace discrimination, and networking. Not only is entering the sector itself a challenge, but so is being respected and trusted as a professional with valued expertise and skills. Many YPs felt underestimated, and many have not had opportunities to discuss their career growth with supervisors or mentors. Limited opportunities to network means many young professionals do not know their peers or colleagues outside their teams or organizations. This lack of visibility in networking not only affects the individuals in the long term, but also the sector, which is dependent on strong networking. Now, these challenges were reinforced by the Youth Call for Action, entitled Work for Us, presented at the 15th, 15th World Forestry Congress in Seoul. 
The YCA was the result of regional consultations involving over 600 youth organizations and youth led by the UNF major group for children and youth and supported by FAO and the WFC Secretariat. We are fortunate today to have two of the main contributors, Erica DiGirolami and Amos Amanubo with us today. And hopefully you'll have a chance to meet them after the session. Similar to YPs, youth highlighted a lack of networking opportunities, unrealistic job expectations from employers, lack of capacity building opportunities on how to build their careers, from successful job applications and interviews to gaining leadership and management skills. So how do we address these issues collectively? To achieve the YCA, we need to engage in intergenerational dialogue and listen to the younger people. We need to ask questions such as, how can the forest sector appeal to the next generation? What do decent jobs and career development look like to youth and young professionals? And how would young professionals like to advance their careers? How can they gain the skills necessary to progress? To address many of these issues young professionals face, as well as to better support the broader youth community, 4YP was launched at the World Forestry Congress in May this year. 4YP is young professionals investing in ourselves for the betterment of our sector's present and future. The network was established because there is a gap in the sector. Young professionals generally feel isolated and excluded from existing networks and wanted more meaningful connections and engagement with their peers around the globe. So what is 4YP? 4YP is foremost a global community for young professionals and job seekers in the forest sector to network, to develop their professional skills and confidence, and gain empowerment. 4YP aims to increase the visibility of young professionals in the forest sector, providing an inclusive space to share ideas, learn, and showcase young professional contributions and expertise. More importantly, our members are 4YP. They are the young professionals and job seekers under age 40, including recent grads and those with less than 15 years experience within the sector. Since launching in May, 4YP has over 350 members globally. And we offer interactive activities that bring members together, including networking events, workshops, and career development opportunities. For example, this week, Parallel to COFO are a number of youth activities, including networking, career sharing sessions, and technical workshops on tools developed by some of the forestry division's young professionals working here at headquarters. Similar events were also organized at the World Forestry Congress in Seoul. And we hope that such activities that, that bring youth and young professionals together and highlight their achievements and contributions to the forest sector become the norm. So the fastest way to rejuvenate the forest sector is to normalize younger experts as presenters, panelists, and moderators in events, and to invite them to join working groups and advisory committees. Because not only do young professionals bring relevant diversity, they offer inspiration to the aspiring youth, making the forest sector more accessible to future generations. So the, for, for, the, for, for the current and future success of the sector, we need to empower our young professionals. This means investing in their career development through increasing visibility, mentorship, and leadership opportunities. So I invite all of you, the next time you're planning a conference and would like to create a networking opportunities for youth, or would like to inject some dynamism through younger expert voices, please consider reaching out to 4YP and work with us to achieve the youth call to action. Thank you. Wonderful, really good. <laughs> Elaine, thank you very much indeed. That's a real call to action. The question is whether our colleagues are ready to receive that call and act upon it. And in a moment, I'll be hearing, we'll be hearing from one of the actors who perhaps is well-placed to answer that call. But for now, I want to thank Director General Dr. Shu Donkyu 
for joining us and lending us uh, your expertise. I know you have to go on to other things, yes. but thank you very much and um, good evening to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Please, see you. Director General. Thank you. Thank you. Tremendous. We've got off to a really good start, haven't we? I think we have. And we're going to build on this now because I was listening, Elaine, to what you had to say. The way you presented the sector from a young people's point of view. And I thought, wow, most of them don't want what they think are dirty jobs. It's not attractive to them. They want something else, something clean, something digital. What you're saying, actually, there is a huge potential here for those people. But it's an isolated, it can be isolating, can't it? You know, for young people, and it takes until your 30s before you feel more stable. I'm really sorry, but well, don't worry, we're going to help you out, okay? We're going to help you out. And Fao and the colleagues are going to reach out to you, I'm sure of it, given the call to action that was issued in Korea. So, one of the people listening very carefully and intently to you is Alexander Buck, the gentleman sitting on our left, who is the executive director of, now this is the acronym, IUFRO, I-U-F-R-O, for Interconnecting Forests, Science and People. And he's going to launch the Global Assessment of Forest Education. So you've paved the way. Alexander, over Thank to you. you. Give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, Elaine, if I would, uh, it's a pity I don't meet the requirements for joining <laughs> for YP because I would have done instantly <laughs> if I could. <laughs> so thanks a lot. Uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Elaine, uh, thanks a lot for actually giving me the opportunity to speak in this uh, setting, Henry, uh, to launch um, a new publication, a brand new publication, which is the Global Assessment of Forest Education. I think, um, as you have just heard uh, from Elaine, the youth call to action is a very welcome reminder uh, that uh, our young professionals are, and the young people are an indispensable source of ambition, creativity, knowledge and innovative ideas for addressing the myriad of problems faced by the forest sector, but also for you know, working towards achieving the globally agreed goals and targets. And as we all know, there are many of those. Um, I think you will agree with me that modern inclusive education on the one hand and mentorship and professional training on the other hand are really the means, the most important means of building the knowledge, skills and the expertise that is needed for a successful career in the forest sector. Therefore, education and career development are closely interconnected. Um, against this background, it really gives me great pleasure to launch the global assessment of forest education. I show the report one more time as part of this session here. Um, really, um, it's uh, one of the building blocks for really giving better opportunities for young people. And by the way, Henry, you don't have to convince me about the power of networking since UFRO is the global network for science collaboration. We work very closely with IFSA, which is the National Forestry Students Association, another network, and we will hear more from them later on, I believe. Um, the, but back to the, the report. Uh, this publication was carried out jointly by three organizations, talking about networking, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the International Tropical Timber Organization, and IUFRO, in collaboration with nine regional partners and a large number of stakeholders as part of a global forest education project funded by the German Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, the BMEL. It constitutes a major contribution to the Global Forest Education Initiative of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests. The two authors of the report, Professor Mika Rekola from the University of Helsinki and Professor Terry Sharik from Michigan Tech University, really did an excellent job in synthesizing the findings of that Global Forest Education project and in um, uh, distilling and processing thousands of uh, the inputs by thousands of forest education stakeholders who contributed their knowledge, uh, experiences and perspectives to the project. The assessment examines the status of forest education around the globe and identifies much needed actions. Uh, it builds on a comprehensive review of the scientific literature 
if I remember correctly, more than 7,000 publications have been reviewed as part of the uh, project, as well as on an online survey that was completed by more than 2,700 respondents, as well as regional consultations um, with more than 500 experts and stakeholders in six uh, regions of the FAO. The report covers all levels of education, from primary via secondary, all the way to tertiary education, universities and colleges. The overall, in a snapshot one could say, the findings of the assessment underpin the need to strengthen or further strengthen forest education. Unfortunately, what the report indicates that we are not really capturing the full potential of attracting talent to forestry and also we are missing, we tend to miss opportunities to stimulate the youth interest in continuing their learning about forest related topics. Um, so, so these are some of the shortcomings that have been identified in the report. At the same time, I don't want to paint a too grim picture. I mean, there are many examples in the report uh, that, um, uh, that show how to successfully nurture the interest of the youth in forests and forest related topics already in early school grades so as to nudge them into choosing a career into the sector. Uh, the report also identifies numerous locally relevant inclusive solutions to forest education that take into account the digital divide, language barriers, as well as issues of gender and racial uh, or ethnic balance. The report finds that graduates are often not sufficiently prepared when entering the workforce. And I think, Elaine, this is also where the link is to, uh, to actually to, for YP. Um, uh, uh, because one of the main areas for improvement that is actually described in the report is to provide many more and better opportunities for out of university learning and work experience. So we need to get students while they are studying, we need to get them out you know, uh, into the field, we need to get them uh, into the private sector to do internships and similar opportunities. And we need to enroll them in mentoring programs so that they can you know, enter into these meaningful relationships, mentor mentee relationships and learn from each other. Another uh, lesson from the, from the report is that actually stakeholders need to be involved or there's a vast potential involved stakeholders more meaningfully in curricular development um, and also in these other activities like outdoor training and workplace learning that I've just mentioned. In other words, the findings of that assessment underpin the vision and the mission of the youth call for action adopted in Korea. And we were there, <laughs> we witnessed it. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, in the short time available here, it is impossible to give you a full and comprehensive overview of all the many and rich details of that report, and especially also of the recommendations to governments, to education institutions, and to intergovernmental organizations. Therefore, I would like to cordially invite you, and here you can see the cover of the report, to join us for a webinar. The webinar will tentatively be held on the 30th of November, around midday Central European time. So please, you know, uh, uh, book that date and time in your calendars, where we are going to have a more in-depth, a fuller launch of the report together with the two authors of the report and with stakeholders. You are very cordially invited to join that webinar and the save the date will be sent out uh, very shortly. The report. I show it one more time, is now available for download uh, from the FAO webpage. So please make sure to visit the webpage to already get your copy, your electronic copy of the report. And of course, it's our hope that the report will inform future actions to strengthen forest education and career development to broadly benefit forests and trees and to contribute to the topic of this session, a bright future for forestry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to Alexander Buck. Wonderful stuff. So there's a real action point there. The webinar on the 30th of November and all are in invited. And I can see there's real synergy between you at Eofro and uh, Elaine and uh, for YP, which is uh, tremendous. But we've been talking in the global sense about forestry. Let's focus down on one particular country now. And we're going to go to our virtual keynote presentation. And the title of it is Tools to detect and prospect skills in the Colombian forest sector. And our speaker is the Subdirector of Monitoring, Analysis 
and Labour prospects at the Ministry of Labour for Colombia. And it is going to be Oscar Fabian Riomagna, um, who will speak in Spanish on career development programs, national forest education, and strengthening the forest sector. Oscar, mucho gusto. Uh, over to you. Good morning from uh, Colombia. Uh, for me, it's an honor to uh, join this meeting organized by FAO. Uh, and I have the opportunity to share with you the main results uh, about uh, an analytical exercise of uh, detecting uh, a skill mismatch in forestry sector in Colombia. Uh, Voy a iniciar mi presentación eh, en español, así que eh, esto tiene un pequeño overview en relación con los principales eh, puntos que hemos eh, desarrollado en este estudio. Si pasamos, por favor, a la siguiente. Okay. Ah, can we have the next si pasamos, slide, por favor, please? Al slide? Yes. Okay. Bueno, hay varios eh, desafíos que están muy bien planteados en el desarrollo de, de este panel de expertos, en donde desde diferentes puntos de vista eh, y desde diferentes países, por supuesto, estamos reflexionando sobre la necesidad de plantear al sector forestal como un potencial para promover la empleabilidad y la formación de los jóvenes, ¿sí? Los factores o cinco factores que ustedes conocen, que es el, la dificultad de conseguir profesionales con las, con las habilidades adecuadas para emplearse en este sector, eh, el hecho también de que tengamos una fuerza laboral cada vez más eh, envejecida por todos los aspectos ya conocidos en relación con la transición demográfica, la falta de crecimiento eh, profesional de los jóvenes que se vinculan a este sector, la migración de zonas rurales a urbanas, y eh, esa pérdida eh, en general que se ha visto en relación con el atractivo que tiene el sector para los, eh, para los jóvenes profesionales que van, digamos, terminando sus procesos educativos y formativos. Si pasamos al siguiente. Next, please. En, en términos generales, ¿sí? Estamos contando que eh, hay alrededor de 73 millones de de jóvenes desempleados en todo el mundo, eh, de los cuales se prevé que para el año 2022, gracias, digamos, a los procesos de reactivación económica que han experimentado los mercados laborales a nivel global, se vea una eh, recuperación paulatina del empleo en los jóvenes. Sin embargo, en este año 2022 se prevé que el 23.3% de estos jóvenes sean ninis, es decir, que ni estudian ni trabajan, están como parte de esa población fuera de la fuerza de trabajo. Entonces, esto, digamos, nos pone eh, en contexto de que las mujeres jóvenes son mujeres especialmente también se afectan por esta situación, siendo de ellas el 27.4% que se prevén desempleadas al final de este año y una brecha de ocupación eh, a alrededor del 40.3% que, digamos, en relación con, eh, con los hombres, en donde la brecha de género también es una constante eh, dentro de este eh, sector, así como, digamos, se prevén las tendencias globales que nos muestra la OIT. Next. Bueno, dentro del estudio específico que tuvimos para el caso eh, colombiano, eh, lo hicimos a través de eh, alianzas con el Ministerio de Ambiente, con eh, instituciones y gremios aliados del sector, eh, este sector eh, tiene un volumen de empleo aproximadamente de 269 mil personas, eh, según cifras de nuestra encuesta de hogares para el año 2021, donde involucra actividades propiamente de silvicultura, extracción, extracción de, y recolección de productos forestales, fabricación de hojas, entre otros. Y son las ciudades capitales pues, que usualmente tienen mayor eh, eh, concentración y participación en el empleo para este sector. 
Bogotá, Medellín, Cali, eh, agrupan poco más del 50% del empleo total de ese sector. Y hay un detalle que llama la atención y es que eh, es un sector que tiene bajos niveles de formalidad laboral. Solamente el 28.9% de los ocupados cotizan a pensiones en ese sector, mostrando también la brecha de formalidad laboral, la brecha de seguridad social, que es uno de los aspectos que deben de trabajarse con urgencia en este sector. Next. Ahora, entonces, eh, en términos generales, las brechas de capital humano las identificamos o, o lo que mencionaríamos como skill mismatch. Eh, vamos a hacer una identificación desde tres perspectivas. La falta de habilidades eh, que se menciona desde el sector productivo cuando no se consigue el personal con las competencias adecuadas o no cubren las vacantes requeridas, cuando los mismos trabajadores o buscadores de empleo, que en este caso están los mismos jóvenes, no tienen el perfil o las habilidades requeridas para desempeñarse en esos empleos, pero también cuando en el sector educativo y formativo hay las falencias o hay esa falta de pertinencia de, cal de calidad y, eh, y sincronía con las necesidades que tiene el sector productivo. Siguiente. Entonces, este estudio especialmente se hizo eh, en un departamento eh, de Colombia eh, que se llama Cauca. Es un departamento que se ubica en el suroccidente del país y es un sector que se priorizó eh, principalmente gracias a, uno, la articulación inter interinstitucional con otras eh, entidades del orden nacional y local y porque este departamento guarda unas características de biodiversidad, ¿sí?, eh, de, de páramo, riqueza natural, de riqueza forestal, que fue, digamos, clave eh, realizar este tipo de priorización para este aspecto. ¿En, en qué tipo, digamos, de, de, de plantaciones se hizo el proceso de levantamiento de la información? En plantaciones con vocación de explotación comercial y en plantaciones de bosques nativos. Siguiente. Bueno, entonces hay varios actores que son eh, importantes dentro del conocimiento de la cadena forestal. Aquí tenemos los, los viveros eh, eh, privados, digamos que son quienes eh, realizan todo el cultivo de las especies propias de la, de la región. Están los propietarios de las fincas eh, silvicultoras, los cortadores, los intermediarios, el, los transportadores y también las empresas que se encargan de hacer, digamos, todo el, el procesamiento de la madera que se extrae de, de este tipo de, de centros. Entonces, esto teniendo en cuenta que son eh, parte de toda la cadena de valor que eh, llevan desde la explotación eh, de una eh, plantación eh, forestal que tiene fines comerciales hasta el producto final. Ya en lo que son, digamos, vocaciones, eh, plantaciones con vocaciones eh, de conservación natural, eh, de reserva forestal, digamos, eh, van unas necesidades eh, diferentes a las que se plantean en este caso específico. Siguiente. ¿Qué tendencias, digamos, a nivel general se identificaron dentro de este componente de prospectiva que se identificó para el sector en los próximos años? Hay unos temas eh, que expertos consultados en este sector mencionaron y que aplican para los dos eh, eslabones que les habíamos comentado. El primero son todos los temas de silvicultura de precisión, eh, construcción sostenible en madera, la certificación en sellos, eh, todo lo que tiene que ver, digamos, con los mercados de carbono, eh, que son, digamos, claves dentro de la conservación del equilibrio eh, climático a nivel global. Eh, eh, también está todo lo que tiene que ver con sistemas de información geográfica, la aplicación de sensores y el mejoramiento genético como parte, digamos, de esas tendencias que impactan las ocupaciones y las habilidades del tipo de trabajadores que necesitará este sector en los próximos años. Siguiente. Ahora, entonces, en materia, digamos, de, de, de los perfiles que se demandan, vemos que este es un, es un sector que no tiene... Eh, quizás una amplia oferta, ¿cierto?, de, de empleos eh, relacionados, por ejemplo, en el servicio público de empleo, pero cuando hacemos alguna revisión específica 
encontramos algunos de ellos como coordinadores ambientales senior, eh, profesionales de logística, auxiliares técnicos ambientales, agrónomos, biólogos en botánica, guardabosques. Eh, y en el caso específico de este estudio, teniendo en cuenta que es un departamento que no tiene un alto grado de desarrollo industrial en el país, se encuentran perfiles eh, cuya experiencia eh, y cuyas habilidades son principalmente empíricas. Eh, pongo en algunos ejemplos especialistas en plantaciones forestales, auxiliares en existencia técnica, operarios de mantenimiento, operarios de viveros, aserradores, operarios de maquinaria, entre otros perfiles, incluidos los ingenieros forestales, que dentro del nivel de cualificación más alto en los niveles de educación universitaria, son los perfiles que digamos, más se asocian a la naturaleza de este sector. Si pasamos al próximo, por favor. Ya en términos generales, cuando revisamos las brechas específicas que se eh, detectan a nivel de habilidades eh, dentro de este sector, encontramos que los ingenieros forestales tienen problemas en diseño de planes de, de manejo de las fincas, los cortadores con la falta de aprovechamiento de la, de la materia prima, los aserradores quizás no tienen cursos, capacitaciones formales que le permitan dar buenas prácticas de cuidado industrial a los insumos, eh, en términos generales, estamos observando carencias de personal, una oferta formativa muy enfocada solamente a temas de ingeniería forestal, dejando los niveles, digamos, otros niveles de atención por fuera. La alineación también con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, que es clave y que no se, no se ve aún reflejado dentro de la naturaleza de este sector. Y eh, hay, habrá una tendencia, digamos, que tendrá un eh, impacto significativo hacia el futuro, que es el mecanizado de cosecha. Pasemos al próximo, ya para finalizar entonces eh, esta presentación. Hay varias herramientas que desde el Ministerio del Trabajo de Colombia hemos desarrollado y que ponemos a disposición del público, que es la clasificación única de ocupaciones para Colombia, el catálogo de ocupaciones OCPACOL, la fuente de información laboral de Colombia, que tienen cifras y tiene información relacionada para todo el mercado laboral colombiano, pero también para aquellas donde podemos hacer un zoom específico en el sector forestal. Si sí, pasamos al siguiente, por favor. Aquí, digamos, ustedes eh, eh, quedan, digamos, con estas herramientas, quedan con eh, estas reflexiones finales para las cuales hemos venido desarrollando estos estudios eh, en nuestro país. El primero es que todos estos resultados son fundamentales para la construcción de estrategias de cierre. Por ejemplo, con el catálogo de cualificaciones, con el marco nacional de cualificaciones, cómo poder mejorar la empleabilidad del talento humano que ya está, pero también de los jóvenes que marcarán el futuro de este sector en los próximos años. Es clave aquí también generar un proceso de reconocimiento de los aprendizajes previos, certificación de competencias para vincular a esta población, formalizarla y darle un reconocimiento digno a sus competencias. También es clave el mejoramiento de condiciones de contratación, eh, la articulación con otros entes nacionales y ponemos a su disposición este estudio, esta información, que esperamos haya sido de total utilidad para cumplir los objetivos de este encuentro. Un honor haberlos acompañado durante este día y estaremos, por supuesto, muy atentos al desarrollo y el éxito de este evento. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you very much to Oscar Fabian Riomania. Thank you very much indeed for that presentation from Colombia. A really interesting study, monitoring study by the Ministry of Labor. They're just looking at some proposals for closing the gaps in the sector, adjusting the education offer so people are more employable, um, both their previous education, that's formal and informal, very, very important. Better involvement of uh, different government agencies, it has to be integrated with real leadership. Yes, leadership from the Environment Agency and the National Development uh, Agency, um, and promoting improvements in contract conditions. People assume that all the youth in Colombia or anywhere else are just interested in AI and coding, etc. But not everybody wants to do AI and coding. Some people want to live, work with living things. These great trees, these organisms, they were here before us. They may be here after us too. <laughs> yes, indeed. Especially those Californian redwoods, some of which are more than 2,000 years old. Sequoia. You see, I know my trees. Sequoia. 
Yes, that's all I know. Um, anyway, so thank you very much for that, Oscar. I mean, this is a really good study which other people can use uh, as well, and um, different stakeholders can dive in uh, and support various initiatives to support the young professionals. Quick response from you, Elaine, on, on that. I mean, I suppose you're encouraged, yes, by what Colombia has done. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we need to see more initiatives done at national levels on, on this. And I, I think the global assessment also provides some information on this on a global scale. And I think countries should be encouraged to look at the four sector labor market to better understand how to close these gaps. Excellent. And uh, I'm assuming, Alexander, you would want to see other countries doing the same kind of detailed study uh, as Colombia has done. Absolutely. I mean, uh, in a way, this is really a, a, a real, uh, really great example of, you know, how to systematically approach the issue and how to really find, you know, innovative, comprehensive approaches to that, uh, to attracting talent, you know, to, uh, to the forest and the trees, to the sequoias. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. I can see you are listening. Excellent. Uh, Alexander Buck, thank you very much for joining us from EUFRO, Elaine Springe from 4YP and Oscar Fabian Riomagna, thank you very much indeed for joining us from the Ministry of Labour in Colombia. Our first panel, thank you very much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Elaine. Wonderful. Okay, so we're going to do a little change around now because we have another panel. This will be the panel that will take us through to the end of this session and then you'll be treated to some music, some vibes, some energy and culture right here on this stage before the reception downstairs in the atrium. Yes, you're going to be, well, certainly you're going to get some drink, maybe some food as well. I'm not sure. Is that true, Tina? Perhaps some food as well. Some good quality, nourishing, sustainable, maybe even circular food. Who knows? Ex yes, apparently there is such a thing as circular food. We will see. Wonderful. Okay, so let me call up Louise. No, Louise is going to be online. Louise Simpson, Executive Director of the Institute of Chartered Foresters. So Louise is going to be online. Uh, we are going to have um, Mariela Chiarella, Manager of Mentorship and Youth Programs from Project Learning Tree Canada, can come up. Vinam Vinamra Matur, Regional Director for Asia Pacific Youth for Nature. Is Vinamra here? Or is she online? Online, very good. Augustin Rosello, I think I saw you earlier. Augustin, President of the International Forestry Students Association. Thank you. <laughs> and Sham Satkura, Executive Director of ITTO. <laughs> Where do you want to share? Shem, yes, I don't, I don't. <laughs> Shem I'm sorry, Shem, we met earlier. I should remember Shem. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank Wonderful you. to have you on again. Okay, so we're going to get some quick fire presentations from each of you. You've heard um, our initial panel set out their stall. We now want to hear from you. I'm going to go to Louise, first of all, Louise Simpson from ICF. Um, you're online, you're the, the executive director. Please build on what you've heard and give us a sense of where we are and where we need to be if we're going to deliver for the young potential YP forestry people, a bright future for forestry. So let's go first of all to Louise Simpson. And each of you is gonna get about three minutes to, you, to do your lightning presentation. Louise, first of all, over to you. Thank you um, and apologies. We've just had a power cut in the building. So if I get darker and darker, it, there's not much I can do about it, um, but hopefully we'll be okay. Um, so I'm just gonna be talking to you about what the UK is doing and in investing in our young professionals. Um, I think we sort of all know the context, but we've legislated for a target of net zero national greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, and we need to increase our woodland cover to uh, 18 to 20 percent. Um, we have about 640 million as, as one of the pots of money um, in, in being invested um, in this, which is very encouraging, although um, with the background of potential public spec uh, sector cuts, um, let's hope that that survives uh, contact. And um, as where we are today, as it, well, or, or 31st of March 2020, around 13% of the UK uh, was covered by woodland, and we planted about 13,660 hectares in 2021. The problem with this is this, this great appetite to plant more trees comes um, coincides with the skills crisis. We estimate that we have a 72% shortfall in our workforce. 
there is a real lack of awareness and understanding by the public about what forestry is. So um, they still regard it as a lumberjack cutting down trees. Um, years of underinvestment in, in the sector, a shortage of industry and school placements, um, and a, a sort of real reduction in forestry further and higher education courses. Um, and they're sort of going down whilst we're telling them that they need to go up. Um, but yeah, they're not coinciding. So what is the sector doing? Uh, well, the Institute published a skills um, paper last year to really sort of highlight the issues that we're facing. We have these things called the Forestry Skills Forums, um, which are based in Scotland, uh, Wales and, and in England. And they look, they're organisations, um, charities who are working within forestry and they look at how to get forestry on the curriculum, how to improve CP uh, career professional development um, and, and, and the, raising the profile of forestry. We have some really good graduate training schemes that um, organisations like Till Hill, Scottish Woodlands um, and Savills um, are running. Um, and uh, they're taking sort of non-forestry graduates and getting them up to speed as quickly as possible. Uh, we've also launched degree level apprenticeships, which seem to be enormously popular. Uh, we had over 400 applications for 40, for 40 places. Uh, so that does seem to be a way to go. And we've also um, launched ourselves um, a leadership um, fellowship, um, which is a six month course, trying to really build um, our young professionals into the emerging leaders of the future. Uh, just a little bit about the Institute with a Royal Chartered Body for Foresters in the UK. We enable young and old foresters to get professional qualifications, supporting members throughout their careers and working to raise professional standards um, and, and to help increase public awareness of forestry. Um, around 23% of our members are under 35 years old. We um, are very keen to grow our talent. And so we ask our young professionals to chair at conferences. We hold specific young professional conferences, although we just moved to calling them uh, early career, career people, just to sort of try and sweep up some of the career changes. Um, we involve young professionals in the governance of the Institute. So uh, we have those on council and various other committees, study tours, we have student membership and we support the 4YP as much as we can. Thank you very much for my lightning tour. Louise, that's great, that's great. You've got a lot in there in your th uh, three minutes and uh, I didn't know 13% of, as a UK person, 13% of the UK was woodland and I thought it was about five. Wow. Uh, and most people, we're totally ignorant. I mean, forestry people are never on the news. We never hear from them, you know. <laughs> I'll do what I can as a news guy to help change that. You, you and I will talk I'll offline. Do that. Yes, I'll try and interview you at some point. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank Let's you. move to Sham, who is the executive director of the International Tropical Timber Organization. Sham, your thoughts and, and to take us forward in, in, in three minutes. What do we need to be doing, do you think? Okay, so thank you. Thank you for that, Henry. And, you know, it's going to be a hard act to follow from the first panel that presented today. And also we have a fabulous, you know, line of speakers for the second panel. Now, what do we need to give? Well, the UN theme this year for youth is inter intergenerational solidarity, creating a world for all ages. I think that is so key. And it's not just a case of the older ones nurturing the young, not just that. The young need to be nurtured into the growth. So it works both ways. Now, in ITTO's case as an organization, we have been running a fellowship program from 1989. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oh, do I have to use the clicker? Damn, sorry, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. I'll try that. Ah, it changed anywho, thank you. <laughs> so I think most of you will know what ITTO as an organization is all about. And we are the, the sole international organization with a mandate on tropical forestry. And you can see from the statistics, the area and the expertise that is required for this massive area of trees, not just sequoias, millions of other species is immense. I'm sorry, I'm not a forester either. Sure, no problem with that. I'm not a forester myself, but there we are. And um, ooh, how do I do this? This one, I guess, right? Fumbling here now. Okay. so. Out of the fellowship courses that we support as an organization, focus, of course, is on capacity building, enhancing training, education, extensions. We also firmly believe that hands-on training, 
in the forestry sector is extremely important. So you cannot learn everything about forestry from textbooks. It's impossible. You need to be out in the field, on the ground. Same thing with the timber industry. You cannot learn to work and operate a processing piece of machinery just by looking at the catalog or at the instruction manual. You know, you need to be feeling, you need to be feeling the material, you need to be working it, you need to be actually talking to colleagues around you on how to better perhaps the working of the machinery. So that hands-on, hands-on is so, so important. And it's up to the older generations, the oldies like me, I'm guessing, and the much younger ones below me, younger than me, to actually help this process move forward. Now, through the fellowship program, you know, this is all the things, it's all background reading. I'm hoping that everyone will be able to get a copy of this presentation because you will be able to see how useful it has been. So it was established in 1989. It has benefited more than 1,400 young professionals from, at the moment, 49 countries. That could grow if our membership grows, of course, wishful thinking, but still. The investment totaled 9.8 million so far. And the major prominent donors have been Japan, the USA, the Netherlands, and Australia. We have had other members also pitching in with smaller amounts of money over the years. So this is the key impact of ITTO fellowships. This is an extremely important slide for all of you to look at, to see the areas in which the fellows have chosen to go. The selection is done by a selection panel consisting of ITTO membership who are mainly foresters, they're all professionals, so they're all evaluated as the applications come in, and the number of fellowships awarded on an annual basis depends on how much funds there is in the fellowship kitty. Over the years, we've seen a slight reduction in that, but we are trying our level best as an organization to get our donors to realize how important and how critical this fellowship program is to be kept going. So these are also high, reasonably high statistics that tell you how they benefited and what changes they, they managed to get out of being part of the fellowship. And you this, have an event in Yokohama. We have an event coming up in Yokohama. At, uh, it's called our 58th session of our council, 7th to the 11th November. But all our social media tags are on the left. You can find everything else through the QR codes. Please do take a look. And who is invited? Members only, I'm afraid, and observers. <laughs> Okay. So let me, t let me say one thing. We have two advisory groups in the council at this point, a civil society advisory group and a trade advisory group. It is my dream also to create a youth advisory group. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. I've just taken up the, the, the reins of the organization. Bear with me for a few months. We will make it happen. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Thank Sam. You. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And you can see from what Louise said earlier, you know, when they had 40 posts, 40 apprenticeship posts, and there was a 10 to 1 um, overload in terms of applications, you know, 400 applications for 40 positions. So people don't just want the AI, as I keep saying, the robots and all that, as interesting that it, as that is, especially post-pandemic, people want to be connected and touch real things, sequoia and other uh, trees. Okay, I'll keep pushing it. Fantastic. Okay, so let's now move to Augustine, or Augustin, Augustin? Augustin Rosello, and Augustin is president of the International Forestry Students Association. We're in your hands. Thank you, yes. Henry. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's for me an honor to be here speaking at COFO 26. Um, this event will always stay in my heart as the first event I attended as IFSA president. I was recently elected one month ago. Um, and while I was uh, preparing this intervention, I started thinking and every time I started realizing how important IFSA has been for all of us. For all of us that are here, we can see IFSA members that are from the youth that has passed through IFSA. And there were three main reasons why that came to my mind. First, it would be impossible for us to be attending these kind of meetings. And this is the first one, for example, COFO that I've attended, but we've been at COP. We were at the World Forestry Congress. Um, we have a lot of representation and for that we thank a lot FAO, we thank a lot of our partners, AUFRO for example that is also here, Forest Europe, the European Forest Institute and if you want to create a youth uh, committee then IFSA would love to take that responsibility. <laughs> um, but now a little bit of why are we, did they, invite me, they invited us to be here. 
it's a little bit to talk about how we are working towards forest education. Um, as a little bit of context, IFSA is a, a student-run organization that it is. Uh, it has over 11,000 members from 130 universities in 60 countries, and we have been developing more than 1,300 projects during the last year. Um, three highlights of this, for example, could be a tree learning platform that we built in which we prepare mentors to learn to teach our students, also to develop soft skills to learn about our world's forest. Also, some IPSA members uh, have prepared impactful projects such as, such as the Youth Call for Action that we are visiting in this event. It was developed mainly by two of our former members, Erika de Jalarami, representing UNMGCY United Nations Forum of Forests, and also our former president, Amos Amanubo, uh, representing the World Forestry Congress uh, Youth um, Agency. Uh, for that also, we thank uh, Peter Choka, especially for promoting youth and for taking us into these spaces. Um, but the main takeaways I, I would like you to take from this intervention are mostly that IFSA provides a network for students all around the world for them to be able to learn by doing. And this is really important because sometimes we don't have the opportunity to do it and it is key for developing the capacities of the youth that are going to be the future professionals in our forest sector. Also that me as president and our fellow IFSA delegates that are here in the IFSA delegation are only just envoys of a movement that is running all around the world and that impacts either locally or also internationally. And also, last but not least, that you, the experts, the professionals, the country representatives, the organizations are the foundations that keep this movement going. Uh, without your support, uh, none of this would be possible. And only together we will be able to achieve our mission that it is fi uh, fighting for a world that appreciates forest. Thank you. Augustine, thank you very much indeed for that presentation on behalf of the International Forestry Students Association. I met your former president when I was in Korea. So welcome to the post, okay? Yeah, Heavy is the head that wears the crown. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, so let's now go back online. And Vinamra Matur is the regional director for Asia Pacific at Youth for Nature. Vinamra, over to you. That's me. Hi, Henry. I uh, hope, hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yes, there you are. Perfect. Um, wonderful. So, a quick, uh, quick introduction. I'm Benamra and I hold multiple roles. Um, I am currently doing a PhD in Malaysia and Borneo, and I've been in one of the lectures given by ITTO during my time at UNU. So, I share that in common with Sham, and we're looking forward to collaborating further. So in my role today, I'm representing uh, Youth for Nature as the um, Asia Pacific Regional Director. And just a quick introduction about who we are. Um, youth for Nature is a youth, is a by youth for youth international organization that educates, empowers, and mobilizes young people to lead and advocate for solutions, both for the ecological and the climate crisis. We are backed by science and grounded in justice. We envision a future where communities will thrive with nature across generations. I think something I need to make clear that we're not a protesting or advocacy group. What makes us unique is that we're a group of young people from around the world that are specifically supporting each other to build our own capacities, find community and access resource and decision-making spaces such as COPO as so that we can better position ourselves and the youth with us to lead on solutions and shape the future in a me meaningful way. By providing young people with resources and capacity, uh, we want to disrupt this idea of disempowerment and contribute to the global youth movement. What we do specifically is we mobilize, elevate, and we bridge. We bridge youth action against biodiversity and climate. We elevate the voices of young people by providing them a flat platform and we mobilize decision makers to take ambition, ac ambitious action for nature and climate by 2030. Next slide, please. Most of our work can be seen in three pillars, which is storytelling and capacity building, as well as knowledge sharing. Within our capacity building pillar, we aim to grow capacity of youth and young advocates to solu for solutions rooted in nature and justice. 
We have supported over 42 global youth uh, in parts of delegations such as the COP27, COP26, uh, as well as the IUCN World um, Conservation Congress. Um, a few of us were also at the World Forestry Congress. I hope we've had met in person before. Our next pillar is storytelling. And storytelling is where we collect and amplify youth-led solutions while we provide tangible support for youth to scale up their work on the ground. Some of our work will be highlighted later at COFO. Um, please do check out the Faces of Forestry um, event and you can meet some of the young minds and speakers who have kind of put their work together in highlighting how forests can be beyond what traditional forestry is um, and how big the uh, need for young people in those voices are. What our priority outcomes are for the next year is basically we want to establish the Foundation Youth for Nature as, a uniquely, as uniquely positioned to deliver on regional specific youth-led work while providing a global multifaceted network. We recognize that the necessary pathway to follow to succeed must include well-equipped and dynamic youth leadership and collaboration in all spaces from the community, which will help in global decision-making. We are at the forefront of putting youth action and enabling young people. That would be my three minutes. Thank you, Henry. Thank you very much indeed for that. Binamra, excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, and then last, but by no means least, Maria Chiarella, Manager of Mentorship and Youth Programs at Project Learning Tree Canada. And you're going to go to the podium, okay? Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Awesome, thanks. Oh. Perfect. All right. Um, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here today and among wonderful panelists and keynote speakers. Uh, my name is Maria Quirela. I am the manager of mentorship and youth programs at Project Learning Tree Canada, an initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. I do want to acknowledge that I live on the traditional territories of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and West Saanich peoples whose historical relationship with the land continues today. So I am really excited to share a little bit about our Green Mentor program and some of the successes that we have seen over the past two years and inspire you to consider mentorship as a tool to invest in the next generation of forest leaders. So mentorship isn't necessarily a new concept. In fact, many of us have probably received mentorship in our lives, either formally or informally. At the root of it, mentorship forces relationships and transfer valuable knowledge from one generation to another. Um, in the forest sector, mentorship can help establish professional relationships and support creating a more diverse and resilient workforce. Through mentorship, employers can also share insider knowledge to help bridge employment gaps and help youth learn the soft skills to get and succeed in a job. And of course, for employers, it's also a great way to recruit and have access to a new talent pool. So since 2020, over 530 people have participated in PLT's Green Mentor programs, creating meaningful and long-lasting relationships for young professionals and advancing their career pathways. In our Green Mentor program, young professionals are matched with established professionals in the sector. We use an industry-leading algorithm that helps us match mentors and mentees based on their personalities, their interests, and more. And mentors and mentees are expected to connect two to three hours per month for about six months and are actively working in the mentee's career goals. Furthermore, mentees participate in career development workshops each month to support their mentorship journey. And so I wanted to share an example of a cohort that we did earlier this year with the World Forestry Congress. In this cohort, we had over 100 participants from 37 different countries. And as a result of the program, mentees reported that 93% of them got a job or advanced in their career because of their mentor. That 88% of participants built a great relationship with their mentoring partner. 
and that 88% of participants felt inspired to work or continue working in the forest sector because of the program. And so we keep hearing from mentors and from mentees how beneficial mentorship is. And so I encourage all the young professionals here today to seek out mentorship and for folks that are in hiring or management positions to consider start starting a mentorship program because mentorship is a great tool to invest in the next generation of forest leaders. Thank you. Maria Chiarella, thank you very much indeed for delivering that presentation on behalf of PLTC, Project Learning Tree Canada. Now, we were due to have a Q&A normally at this particular point, in case you have any thoughts, any questions, any queries that you want to put to our panel. We are running way over time because we started late, sadly. Okay. Um, so if there's anybody who has one very quick point or one very quick question, make it good, then please let me know, raise your hands. Oh, yes. And please let us know who you are. I can't see. Can you put your microphone on? Doesn't work. We'll get a microphone to the gentleman, please. Please make it very brief. Thank you. Very briefly. Thank you, Mr. Cordini. Uh, and uh, thanks for the panel as well. But we all see this, uh, this uh, recommendations about increasing resources for young people to get more uh, development and training. But uh, I, was, I wanted to ask Alexander and Elaine, in your survey, did any of the young people you interviewed to tell you that where did they get the resources to do uh, or were unable to get resources to do further development? Thank you. Okay, Alexander, you can respond briefly to that. Yes, yes, it is. In this report, actually, really access or limited access to educational resources or resources more broadly about career development was mentioned as one of the uh, bottlenecks where we can do much better. So, so that indeed is something where, where we can do better. Thank you very much. Does anybody have a question for one of our young panelists here? Let's have a look. Do we see any? No, no questions. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, ask a question of you, Maria, first of all. Um, what, what is the vision, really, for your youth initiative moving forward? And, and what do you think it will take to achieve this vision? continue mentorship we know that it works and we're really excited about what it could grow into um, I think for us it's just really important to continue to connect with different organizations and see if we can partner um, we also think that this is a great way to encourage more young women um, to get into the sector at least in Canada right now there's only about 17 to 18 percent of women representation so it's really important when we talk about uh, gender Tremendous. And Augustine, let me ask you, what attracted you to this sector? Well, it's a difficult question, but <laughs> I've always been linked. It's a very important question because there are lots of Augustines out there who think their future is, is in robotics or something like that. So what attracted you? No, for me, robotics doesn't work. I'm not linked to technology, but um, when I started, actually, I fell by accident like Elaine was talking. It's something very common that we've seen in the association. Uh, but once I started seeing what the topics were, when I started going to the forest in my career, that made me fall in love with the forest, starting to make me start to want to spend more time there, to keep it, to, to work for it. And then I started meeting all these different people that were searching the same outcome. So IFSA has provided that community that I didn't know it existed and all along the world. So for me, once now, it's no chance that I would choose wrong. Very good. Thank you very much indeed. Vinamra, how much impact do you think you're having at Youth for Nature? Thank you, Henry, for that question. Um, overall, if we feel like we're creating and uplifting all of these marginalized voices and being able to connect uh, young people to go into spaces which are technically they're shut out from or they're not being able to access due to funding or opportunity. So we have a network of over 200 global ambassadors uh, who are able to access uh, such opportunities and the impact can be seen 
um, throughout storytelling and the true capacity that we've built. Tremendous. And um, Sham, you've only just taken on this post as executive director of the ITTO. Mm -hmm. How will you know if you're delivering this rich, inviting, diverse sector that's going to attract all these young people into it? How much time are you going to give yourself before deciding whether you've succeeded or failed? <laughs> Henry, that is a loaded question. I have worked journalist. in tropical forestry for nearly 30 years. You didn't know that. No, I didn't. Right. So the, in terms of taking up the leadership of the organization, of course, my main priority now is to forward the aims and the objectives of the organization. And we can complement what the organization has already achieved over the years. It's a tremendous organization. I'm not saying that because I'm the ED, but because I've been involved in tropical forestry for over 30 years, I see the potential. The forestry sector now, particularly the tropical forestry sector, there are so many opportunities that we should actually be optimizing on. It has become the, the center of international fora. Mm -hmm. It has become the center of international negotiations. It's become multifaceted. It's no longer just trees going on a piece of land. It's no longer that. Maybe 40 years ago, that was the case. Mm -hmm. In the last two decades, it has evolved so much. Yep. It is a valuable resource and the young people are the custodians for the future. Okay. We need, we need skilled and committed young people who actually love working in forestry, not because they've been pushed into it. No. You know, I was never pushed into forestry. I walked into it voluntarily. I'm forestry, forestry found you. I found forestry. You found forestry. Right. Ah, so. the forests were always there, but you found them. And I haven't left it. Wonderful. Put I your hands together it. for our panel. Put your hands together for Sham Sakuru. Yes, and for else, Maria you know. Chiarella, <laughs> Vinamra Matur, Augustine Rosello and Louise Simpson. Panel, thank you very much. Keep your seats because I would like, now like to, nice to meet you. invite uh, the team. Look, they're getting on famously already, even before the wine and the canapé en vol au vent. Um, but oh, we're in Italy, it's not going to be canapé, it's going to be something even nicer. Wonderful. So thanks very much to our panellists. I would like to introduce our final speaker, Mr. Ross Hampton, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest-Based Industries, who provides some closing remarks. You can keep your seats if you want. Yeah. Over to you, Ross. Thanks, Henry. And it's not much, it's not a speech, so don't worry. I know we are about to have round food, Henry, and round drinks. But the, the reason that uh, ACSFI, your Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest-Based Industries, was really pleased to sponsor the event tonight and, and the rectangle downstairs is the rectangle uh, it's about the place that we will all meet. It's about the networking opportunity that we want to provide to you. Um, I, could have, I could have prepared a full list of all of the scholarships in the industry and run through them with you. You'll be pleased to know I decided to leave that down there in, on the seat. And I thought um, just what I would want to hear if I was you and listening to me was, and I'm in the last stages of my career, and many of you at the beginning is, well, what did you do? How did you actually get to be a leader in forest industries? And, and so I thought I'll just do that very, very quickly, and I'll do it in, in a way that you can recall pretty, pretty ho hopefully you'll be able to recall this. So I do need a volunteer, and a uh, little tip, if you, are, if you are public speaking, always do this because the audience is then really interested because you're probably going to fail miserably at what the next stage of your talk is and everyone leans forward. So I need to know if we've got a, a Beverly or a Bevan here tonight. I, I'll, take, I'll take anyone in the booths. I'll take anyone online. Okay. Therefore, this is where it gets interesting. I'm going to say, uh, you all know Peter at the back there. Peter, can you put your hand up, please? For, Peter's now volunteering to be Bevan because I, I need you to remember when you see him around the corridors that he's really Bev. And the reason I want you to remember that is because I want you to remember B-E-V. Because when I was your age, when I was able to join Elaine's fantastic sounding uh, group, uh, the thing that I wasn't was brave. And I reckon the people up here are brave and online, you're amazing. I just couldn't have done that when I was your age. But all of you, and I bet you're not nervous at all, right? So the, the folks who've been presenting today, it's been no nerves at all, no. But it, it is something you have to be if you really want to take those steps forward in your career. And it, it means taking opportunities, even when you think they're a bit too big for you, yeah. and, and winging it sometimes. The second uh, in Bev, in, in our nickname for Peter, 
is, probably, no one can probably guess it, you've got to be an expert. Now that sounds kind of daunting because you're at the beginning of your career, you're not at the end of your career. And, and so you think, well, what do I have to do, a PhD or a master's? That's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is you've all got opportunities in whatever you're doing to become better at it. And that means the things that are the soft skills as well as the hard skills. Uh, even, uh, for example, a lot of you are in FAO, I presume, so you have, you have the soft skills of actually knowing how this very bewildering place works. Uh, someone like me comes from Australia and ends up walking out for a coffee and, and coming back at five past five and having to shake the gates trying to get in and thinking I've been abandoned on the street. But uh, you know, if you know, if you know how FAO works, that's just a little thing, but you know how interventions work, you know how plenaries work, you know your way through the labyrinth out there. These are actually skills. This is part of your expertise. Um, and one of the things I say to young people in our organisation is, you may have other chances to go elsewhere in your career, and sometimes you really will want to. And if you want to be an author, like I really do, I still haven't finished that book, I've been writing forever, um, you might want to change career and do that. But if, you, if you're just having a bad day at the office, uh, think about it hard, because the longer you stay in a general sort of area, the more of an expert you're going to be, and the more the more uh, rewarded you'll be for that as you go through your, your career. All right, we're up to the last letter. Anyone can guess it? We actually, it's been mentioned a couple of times this evening. I, I, I think uh, Elaine actually even said the word visibility. That's Peter's last uh, letter, Bev. Visibility. COVID's not been good to the young people in our sector, I think, uh, because of because of the lack of connectivity in the office, the lack of personal engagement and time together. And that internet is not your best friend. And, and those Zoom meetings or Teams meetings when you keep your camera off, it actually may be better if you're in your onesie, I get that, or if it's been a really big Sunday night. But actually, it, it actually takes away um, from me, people like me who might have a whole lot of people we're trying to engage with, it takes away something from our interaction. And the same goes for not being in the office so much. And the same goes, by the way, for choosing your background on your Teams call. Probably you've never heard this before, but if I ask you to think for a moment about, about the Director General uh, or about politicians, about senior people who, have, who, who do calls out through the internet, what do you see behind them? You don't see a Scandinavian sauna or a palm tree. You see something that means something. It's trying to tell people something about them, about what's important to them. It's not always possible. I get that if some of you are working from bedrooms or kitchen tables. But if you think about what it means, what do you mean in your presence in the workplace? It also means you're more likely, when people are like me are rushing down corridors, to be the person who's remembered uh, and, and then said, well, I, I suddenly need someone to accompany me to COFO. So that person's been terrifically visible in the office. We know they can do the job. They've shown that they've got the ability and you'll get extra opportunities. Or at least that's what I would have told myself when I was more able to join uh, for YP than I am now. So uh, that, that, I directed that really, Henry, to the, to the younger folks in the audience, but I hope everyone who is like me is on the other side of that threshold is listening as well because we have to we have to be there for these opportunities for our people coming through the sector we have to be the ones who hand them the footy wrong right kick them the soccer ball sorry henry uh you know not not right at well not after the goal and just ask them to carry it back for us but three quarters of the way down and then as they as they mature and, and, and you know kick it to them a bit early see how you go but be there in support be there ready to to uh, help them with the training that they need to take it a bit further. Look for them. I've asked them to be visible. You make sure you see them. I've got to make sure that I see them and I don't just get busy with uh, the chief executive things that I have to do. Right, so what, were the, what are we calling Peter from now on? Bev. Bev. <laughs> so we're gonna, have a, we're gonna have a drink and a mingle and you're gonna have the chance to be visible. Thanks, Henry. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you very much. A brave expert who is visible, yes? Yeah, that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Ross Hampton, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Forest Based Industries. Now, thank you very much for being with us. Don't go anywhere yet because um, we're going to move the chairs away.